Writing at its best is a lonely life. Organizations for writers palliate the writer's loneliness, but I doubt if they improve his writing. Ernest Hemingway wrote those words after receiving the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1954. He was one of the most influential literary stylists in the 20th century. He's renowned for novels like The Sun Also Rises, A Farewell to Arms, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and The Old Man in the Sea, which won the 1953 Pulitzer. I've been a Hemingway fan all my life. I knew most of what he had written and I knew his life story, but I didn't know this story that I say emerges from the shadows. You would think it might be hard to find new insights into one of the most famous lives in literature, but author Nicholas Reynolds' book, Writer, Sailor, Soldier, Spy, Ernest Hemingway's Secret Adventures, reveals an untold fact that Hemingway offered to be a spy for Soviet intelligence and for the United States during World War II. After 1935, and especially after this, the, he got involved in the Spanish Civil War, he was a political activist. His cause was anti-fascism. Like the celebrated subject of his book, author Reynolds has led a colorful life himself, working for the military on and off for 40 years. With a PhD from Oxford University, he joined the United States Marine Corps in the 1970s, serving as an infantry officer and then as an historian, most recently for the Central Intelligence Agency. A lot of my time at the agency was spent in Washington, D.C., uh, doing tasks that are are, are not that sexy, but that were satisfying for me. As I said, as an archivist for the CIA Museum, Reynolds was responsible for developing its strategic plan and helping to turn remarkable artifacts into compelling stories. The printed words always had power for me. I've known that for a long time, either uh, implicitly or explicitly. When you read Ernest, uh, you, know, you, you, you get an even greater sense of, of the power of words. And with a few words, he conveys uh, scenes, emotions so powerfully. Combining his love for writing and acumen for research, Reynolds has written the first book that puts Hemingway's interest with the Soviets in the broader context of Hemingway's life. You know, the, the, I, I call the book Writer, Sailor, Soldier, Spy, so it's Writer, Sailor, Soldier, Spy. He was good at a lot of things, but he was, I think, in a class by himself as a writer. We discuss this riveting story next in this first person one-on-one -on -one with Nicholas Reynolds, presented by St. Louis County Library and HEC-TV. We are in the Library and Research Center of the Missouri Historical Society here in St. Louis, and a great place for you to be, Nick Reynolds. You should feel right at home as a former CIA archivist and historian and author of Writer, Sailor, Soldier, Spy, Ernest Hemingway's Secret Adventures. Great book, great read, and I welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. What did you know about Ernest Hemingway before you started writing the book? I've been a Hemingway fan all my life. I knew most of what he had written, and I knew his life story, but I didn't know this story that I say emerges from the shadows. It really started way back during the, um, the Spanish Civil War, the Spanish Civil War, so it, the, the book opens uh, in a hurricane in 1935 in the Florida Keys, and I call that a conversion experience that you see in a lot of spy cases. There's something that knocks the person out of their day-to-day -day routine, and that started the process. Then the Spanish Civil War uh, really heightened the process, and then he becomes active in his various adventures uh, during World War II. And that's kind of the key point, or the turning point, when, during that Spanish Civil War, where he kind of turns from a journalist into an activist, and, that, and his writings kind of change, start to change, don't they? It does. And so before 1935, Ernest was largely apolitical. Uh, he just didn't care that much, and if you'd asked him what his politics were, he might have said libertarian, or he might have said that he voted for a socialist once. Uh, whether that was true or not, we don't know. But uh, after 1935, and especially after this, the, he got involved in the Spanish Civil War, he was a political activist. His cause was anti-fascism. You knew about, and you said you read about Hemingway, and how he's ever been a fan. Did anything you read during your research change your opinion of him? Oh, absolutely. There's this story that's been out there for a long time about his chasing German submarines, about 
uh, his uh, liberating the bar at the Ritz in Paris. Uh, and then I went a step further and I found that he had had this relationship with the Soviets uh, starting in, uh, he met them in Spain, but it was an informal relationship then. In 1940, it became a formal relationship, and that was very surprising to me. And what prompted you to even go this route, just because you had a love of his work? I live in Washington, D.C., or just outside Washington, D.C. Lots of archives, libraries, whatnot. The National Archives uh, has a large facility in College Park. Maryland, and you can call up OSS Files, that's Office of Strategic Services, American Intelligence in World War II. And when I went there to see what I would find on Hemingway, I found three Hemingway files. I found Ernest, I found his brother, and I found his son. So, and they each found their way to OSS separately. So it wasn't like, you know, one got there first and called the other one and said, hey, you know, you want to talk to my brother or my son? or whatever, they each had their own special way into OSS. And I thought, this is kind of strange. This is, you know, there seems to be intelligence in the Hemingway blood here. So I sensed a story. I didn't really know what the story was, but I started pursuing that story. And that's how I eventually found uh, the Soviet connection. How was this process of researching Hemingway? Um, was it hours and days inside of the CIA archives? Well. It wasn't that much in CIA archives. All the sources I used are unclassified. And so these are sources that are available in the Library of Congress, in the National Archives, uh, in British archives. Uh, for a while they were available in Soviet archives or, or East, uh, I should say Russian archives. Um, I spent a lot of time in archives and libraries, uh, Princeton and um, the Princeton University Library has a lot of Hemingway correspondence, and so does the JFK Library outside Boston, and that's where the Hemingway papers are, and that's, that's thanks to an agreement between Mrs. Hemingway and Mrs. Kennedy uh, when they were both widows. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Kennedy offered Mrs. Hemingway the opportunity to store her husband's papers there. And it's a wonderful place to go. It's a reading room. This is a wonderful reading room, but that's just the most remarkable reading room. It's, it overlooks Boston Bay, and you've got, uh, the, the reading room is uh, set up to be a reproduction of his living room in, uh, in Cuba, in his house in Cuba, which was his principal residence for the last 20 some years of his life. What is it, was it, about Hemingway that men and women alike uh, seem to be drawn to him, even so far after his death. Great writer, obviously, a great writer of that time and still standing. I think, I think still standing. I think, yes. you know, uh, somebody asked Gellhorn that question once and, and she said, you know, we just don't know. He can do it and, and the rest of us can't do it as well. She was a good writer, but she wasn't, you know, she, she wasn't in his class. Uh, so that's one thing that, that's, that's, uh, that, that keeps us coming back is, is uh, you know, his, this amazing ability uh, to string words together and, and create an effect. Uh, the other, uh, other thing that I think uh, keeps us interested in Ernest is he's so many things to so many different people. So if you don't like, if you don't like Ernest the misogynist, well, you can look at Ernest the fisherman or Ernest who was kind to uh, young scholars or uh, younger writers. He wasn't that kind to people who were at his level or close to his level. Uh, there was a lot of competition there. But if somebody was a college professor or a, or, or a writer who was starting out, uh, he was great. Interesting, yes. I, I would agree with that assessment, so true. Let's go back to his uh, Soviet ties, and I guess that goes back to that turning point, back to the Spanish Civil War. That wound up putting him in touch with the Soviets, did it not? You mentioned that earlier. It did, so in, you, you gotta go back. It's the Depression in America. Uh, a lot of the Eastern intellectuals, writers, artists, uh, turn to the left. They think capitalism is dead. Uh, and so he already knows a bunch of American communists or, or people who you might call fellow travelers. And then when he goes to Spain, he meets some of the same people and then he meets their Soviet counterparts. Uh, so he meets 
people who are literally commissars. He meets secret policemen. He meets Soviet generals. These people are populating his life uh, to an extent that definitely didn't happen before. So without the Spanish Civil War, we probably wouldn't have this story because Ernest didn't, you know, the Spanish Civil War changed him in more ways than one. It, uh, it was a cause that he believed in and uh, it was an opportunity to meet these people who made a difference in his life. So what did the Soviets potentially see in Hemingway? Well, initially they didn't know. And they were just kind of, they thought, the Soviets kept, uh, you know, who, who knew? So these guys, these guys are revolutionaries. They're Bolsheviks. They're, they're Leninists and Stalinists. And, and they're, they, they just love to collect they're also Russians, and so they love to, they've got this uh, decades or, or centuries long tradition of um, spying. Well, he is a well-known writer. He's a face of America over there, I would think. Oh, absolutely. He's, yeah. His writings are read over there. He was very popular in the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, you could, you could speculate why. Was he popular for the same reasons that, um, that he's popular outside the Soviet Union? Or is it because it's, it's escapist? for them, uh, and, and maybe the, so on one level it's escapist, on another level it really appeals to them that, that one man, you know, the, so many of his characters are, are individuals on their own, fighting the system, breaking away from the, the Italian army in Farewell to Arms, uh, in, um, in For Whom the Bell Tolls, you know, it's the one guy at the bridge making a difference in the offensive. So. Uh, that kind of writing appeals to the uh, to people in in the Soviet Union. Yeah, he was a soldier first, and they gave him a code name, which really had to Argo. play to his ego. Yeah. He, well, Argo. he didn't know what you you wouldn't know your code name. Oh, you wouldn't. You would not know that that was your code name. So that code name okay is used in cable traffic, uh, so that if anybody intercepts or finds a copy of of uh, a particular cable, you don't know what it you don't know who the, you don't know the identity. Was he ever paid by the Soviets? No, he was an ideological recruit, uh, which is spy talk for, it, it, it can be spy talk for two things. One, uh, the one is you don't take money. You, you're, you're motivated by your political ideology. Um, the other ideolo ideologic, if you say ideological recruit, it could mean somebody who's over the top ideologically really believes in communism or, or some aspect. He was never a communist, okay, he doesn't, he doesn't subscribe to the communist ideology. He's an anti-fascist who he would say was a, allied with the Soviets because they were on the same side of that issue. Well, I mean, we were allies at, during World War II. We were, in 1941. Yeah, so 1940, December yeah. 1941. Before that, uh, the U.S. technically was neutral. And he was frustrated with the U.S. because the U.S. had not uh, taken part in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, Post-World War II, we've got the whole McCarthyism era happening, it's scrounging for communist authors, artists, you know, anyone from Hollywood, it seemed, uh, actors, uh, who lost their livelihoods. So how did this affect Hemingway? Uh, was he fearful that he would be exposed for having any kind of relationship with Russia? I think so. I, I, you know, he, he had this relationship with the Soviets. He was not a great spy for the Soviets. Uh, and his motivation was anti-fascism, not pro-communism. Uh, but he knew that the bar was set so that uh, anyone with even a slight amount of contact uh, could be in trouble. Uh, so I, my argument is he was looking over his shoulder during the McCarthy period, and, and that conditioned his um, that conditioned his mindset and changed, changed his behavior. So in, in 1940, for instance, he would sign up to various committees to help political refugees from Europe, especially ones from the Spanish Civil War. Uh, in 1950, he wouldn't do anything of the sort. So the same people came to him and said, hey, Ernest, uh, you know, can, you, can you write a few words for us? Uh, can you appear? Can we use your name? And uh, he said no. And then? during those, the McCarthy era, he gets a bit paranoid. He and does. So he's, as I say, he's, he keeps looking over his shoulder. In fact, there's nobody there. Uh, the FBI is not after him. Uh, you know, and I'm not saying that because I'm a secret apologist for the FBI or I was ever on their payroll. Um, but you didn't, you, you saw Herbert Hoover's handwriting. You, saw, you Herbert write Herbert Hoover's, it. so yeah, and the, the, there is a Hemingway file. Yeah. 
in the, one of the last pages of the Hemingway file, J. Edgar Hoover is making notes in his own handwriting. And basically he says, you know, uh, yeah, sure, Hemingway was all, always stood up for the underdog, um, but he was no communist. He was just a rough, tough guy with a big heart, you know? And that's, who knew? Who knew? I mean, this is, this is like the, 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 you know, the kindler, gentler J. Edgar Hoover that, that uh, never comes out. So he did have that side, and uh, the FBI, I'm convinced, was not after Hemingway. So you said earlier that Hemingway really wasn't a good spy for the Soviets. In what way, and what did he, did he help at all? No, he wanted to support anti-fascism. He didn't want to betray the United States, he wanted to support anti-fascism. He might have been a good spy for the Soviets in Spain and he, he performed various tasks that uh, the Soviets would have a spy perform. But like, what would he do? He would have to go have a conversation with someone or yeah. report back? Well, yeah. Journalists are often used to write articles that are favorable to the, to the, the, the master. So he did that. He, did, he wrote articles that were favorable to the, the cause they had in common, which was anti-fascism in Spain. Uh, he made a film that he showed at the White House. He, he and the filmmaker, who was a lifelong communist named Joris Ivans, and a common turn agent, and they tried to persuade Roosevelt to change his policy on Spain. Uh, that would be, that's an agent of influence. That's something spy agencies love to do. But I think after he signs up formally with the Soviets uh, at the end of 1940, the beginning of 1941, he almost immediately has buyer's remorse. So a few months, within a few months, uh, he's distancing himself from, uh, from that commitment that he made to them. They come around five or six times after that and say, hey, you know, you signed up to do this, are you gonna do it? And he says, great to see you. I think it's wonderful what you're doing against the Germans on the battlefield, and I'll get on this tomorrow, but tomorrow never comes. What do you feel was Mr. Hemingway's greatest accomplishment? Winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, I, no, no, the greatest accomplishment. So it's it's got to be in the field of writing. And uh, you know, I can I can answer greatest accomplishment as a spy separately. But but so, you know, the, the, I I call the book writer, sailor, soldier, spy. So it's writer, sailor, soldier, spy. He was good at a lot of things, but he was I think in a class by himself as a writer. What did you most and least admire? I admire the writing, I admire his sense of adventure and imagination. I don't admire his needing to be the center of attention in charge uh, and his, his, he was a tough guy to deal with a lot of the time uh, and I don't really admire that. I don't admire the way he was overconfident in the political arena. Uh, he thought he knew stuff that he really didn't know. Uh, and, um, you know, it was, it was a matter of overreach. And do you relate to him and his qualities that you just mentioned and aspects as an, and his experience to an archetype of literature? I mean, is he kind of like his own character? <laughs> well, uh, people have said that many times that he, you know, is, is, he, is, he, is Hemingway putting himself in his books or is it the other way around? Does he write the book and then he, does he go and try and live the adventure? Uh, I think the answer is it's a little of both. Uh, it, starts, it certainly starts out more the other way. He has, he has an adventure and then it appears in literature. Uh, and this is part of the reason he moves around so much. So he lives in Paris, then he lives in, in Key West, then he lives in Cuba. Uh, and, and I've read the theory that uh, he uses the people and place, uh, he, uses, uh, he used Paris and the people he knew in Paris. He wrote that wonderful book, uh, Sun Also Rises. Then he's gotta go because he's, he's said all these, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's washed too much of the dirty linen in public. Uh, and, and people are mad at him. Well, he obviously liked women beyond his wives. <laughs> so we, the company of women, let's put it this way. He, he did like the company of women. There's some dispute. I mean, if, you, if you just read what he says, you know, he was a philanderer on, a, on an epic scale. Uh, but 
I think it's just bravado the, then? Some, some of that's got to be bravado. There's a great book, uh, there's a chronology uh, by a man named Brewster Chamberlain. And, you know, some of this stuff just doesn't add up. Or a man of his times in terms of in his relationship with women, in ter that always needed to be seen as in charge. He needed to be seen as, as in charge. Right. Uh, that wasn't just with women, though. He needed to, he, he, he needs to be in charge of, of anything that's going on. Um, pretty much. So, he, you know, when he, when he comes into the room, he sucks all the air out of the room. It's all about him. Right. Yeah. And I mean, and that was some of the attraction, I think, for some of these, for the women. Um, the first wife, Elizabeth Hadley Richardson, who's born in St. Louis, she was strong in her own way. She was a little timid, but yet, but in the same vein, st strong and wealthy, too. I think that helped them in their early years. <laughs> he lived off her. Yes, he did. You know, she wasn't. She wasn't enormously wealthy. She didn't have a mansion, but she did have a trust fund, and that enabled him to that enabled them to live in Paris. Uh, and some of the things that he wrote about being poor in Paris are a little bit of a stretch, uh, because they always had, uh, you know, they always had the cushion of Hadley's trust. There are patterns in Ernest's life, in, in his relationships with his wives. You see him kind of repeating. It's almost as if he keeps trying to do it till he gets it right. He seems to return to his roots in, in a way, and so maybe that's why he kept, kept falling for uh, <clears throat> ladies from, from... The Midwest. From the Midwest. <laughs> well, so the last one is also from the Midwest, Mary. Uh, Mary's from Minnesota. What did you learn about that period of time period in which the book is set that you did not previously know? I didn't know the extent of Soviet espionage in the United States. There were no diplomatic relations between the U.S. and the Soviet Union until 1933, so it's, br it's broken off when the Bolsheviks take over, and then there's a period of no relations. Roosevelt comes in, and uh, diplomatic relations are uh, reestablished, and the Soviets use this to establish a really extensive network of spies uh, in the United States, mostly on the East Coast, I mean, but not exclusively, and they they do this they do this partly because that's what they do uh, you know it's in their nature and um, partly because they they know they're te behind technologically so they want to steal technology they do a great job of stealing technology they also just don't understand uh, the world outside the Soviet Union so part of it is to find people who do understand that world and, and get those people to explain it to them. So has writing this book on Hemingway inspired you to do further research on him or even that time period? I, I probably will write another book because I enjoy the process. I'm, I love research as, uh, you know, I love places like this. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, so, uh, and I like, I like to write. And I, I also learned in, in writing this book, uh, I learned uh, how important other people are you know, yeah, the writer sits by himself or herself at a, you know, they, they have to go sit in their chair every day uh, or the book doesn't get done. But a really good book, um, unless you're Ernest, uh, but even Ernest had Max Perkins, right? Right, that's right. And he, and he had uh, Fitzgerald and some of the others who would critique his stuff. I've learned how important others are to, to getting a book written. Right, to bounce off of, sure. Um, how did you become a CIA archivist historian? So at CIA, I was a line officer, but then uh, I got an offer I couldn't refuse from the director of the CIA uh, museum. And so I became the historian for the CIA museum. I didn't even know if there was a CIA Hashtag museum. The best museum you, you've never seen. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's on, I mean, it's lay people, we cannot go see it? Usually not. <laughs> well, they, they like to do, uh, they occasionally like to do stories, but mostly it's for the employees. There is a website that you can have a virtual tour at CIA.gov. Otherwise they'll have to kill us? No. I'm no, <laughs> it's all unclassified. It's all, but gotcha. the, it's, it, the, it's to reinforce the employees' knowledge of CIA history and their identity uh, as people working for an organization with a long history. How do you, as a historical author, decide how to handle conversations that were not recorded? Okay, well, I don't do it. I, as a historian, will not put quotation marks on something I have not seen in a first-hand source um, by someone who was there. 
that goes with how you evaluate evidence in general as a historian. So I'd, I'd, I'd want something corroborating. I'd want it to fit the context. I want it to fit the personality. Uh, ideally, I have two or three sources on, on a meeting. So um, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's an art form to this. Sure. So th that leads to my next question. What are the ethics of writing about historical figures? If the historical figure is a public figure, they've kind of, they, you know, they, they've opened themselves up really to journalists, historians. Most of the people who appear in the book uh, are now dead. I might leave things out if the people were still alive. Um, if they're dead, I'm still very careful. I'm very, there's, there's what, 30, 40 pages of footnotes in there. So uh, I hew very closely to the sources. That's, that's the difference between historians and, and other people in other disciplines. The, the historian's conceit is he stays very close, he or she stays very close to the sources. Uh, that's not to say that the memoirist who writes, or, or, the, or the novelist, who, who Paula McLean, who, or, and other people who've written about Hemingway, that's not to say there's anything wrong with their books. It's just, uh, you know, and they, they choose to write novels um, so that they can, they can reconstruct a conversation that I wouldn't do in my book. If I were more skilled, I'd write both, but I'm not, I, I can write nonfiction, but I can't really write fiction. So you're going through all this research, looking at these files. How do you winnow through and decide which incidents to, to report? I first came up with a, the general outlines of the story, and, and then I, I put things in there that uh, I thought supported the story. And, and, and I, as I said earlier, I had a wonderful editor, Peter Hubbard, at uh, William Morrow, and you know, Peter would say, you need to talk more about this or less about that. So, uh, you know, he, he was enormously helpful. Ever, ever any debates about that? Did you fight for anything? You know, uh, he is such a good, uh, I've been edited by other people uh, in the past, and you know, when I open the email or pick up the telephone, it's like, eh. um, you know, I'm about to get feedback on my writing. Uh, but I never felt that with Peter. Peter is just so good at, at, uh, at providing feedback or rudder, I should say. It's more like, it's, it's more like kicking the rudder or the, um, a little bit this way or that way. Uh, we, never, we never really had like, um, you know, yes I will, no you won't uh, sort of discussion. That's, that's helpful, that's, makes it a little more pleasant. That's wonderful. That's, well, that's part of my motivation for wanting to write another book is that I've got such a great relationship with him and, 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 and the whole HarperCollins staff in general, but the, the relationship with the editor is so key, and, and so he makes me more creative, he makes me a better writer. Uh, he, he, his, knowing, that, knowing how he edits conditions me to look for certain things. What was an early experience where you learned that writing and language had power? The printed words always had power for me, um, and I, I think I've known that. I've known that for a long time, either uh, implicitly or explicitly. And when you read when you read Ernest, that you get an even greater sense of of the power of words. And and he, with a few words, he conveys uh, scenes, emotions so powerfully. So I, I have to, I'm going to kind of break away from this thought and just say, you, you are sporting that Hemingway beard. <laughs> I kind of buried the lead here. <laughs> well, Do people say that to you since you've do, written about they him? They <laughs> do. Uh, when I turned th uh, 65, I told my wife she had a, she had a choice, uh, earring, tattoo, beard. Uh, and she said, well, let's try beard. <laughs> <laughs> but you do resemble him as very much so. Again, the book is Rider, Sailor, Soldier, Spy, Ernest Hemingway's Secret Adventures, a great read. Thank you. Thank you. He may have remembered that the Soviets still wanted him to travel overseas on spy business. A few months later, in November 1941, a message from Moscow Center directed the NKVD's New York station to, quote, look for an opportunity for him, Hemingway, to travel abroad to countries of interest to us, end quote, presumably to interact with the elite and collect information as he had in China.